Hey, what's up? And welcome to the Dunnealytics podcast. First of all, I want to thank you so much for clicking on this video and giving me a chance. Now, before we get to the first entry, I think it's important to tell you the goal of this podcast. The goal of Dunnealytics is to get people that work in various industries and learn about what it's like to work in the industry. I think it's important nowadays, especially with COVID and everything, that it's changed the job market dramatically and just how we see the world. So my goal is to get these people and get insight on what it's like to work in these various fields. Hopefully, this will provide some entertainment, some laughs, or at the very least, some information that you didn't know previously. I want to thank you once again for checking out this podcast. My goal is to get about two to three videos out per week. That all depends on how many guests I can get and just the availability. However, if not, I will promise that I will have at least four videos out each month. So once again, I want to thank you so much for checking out this podcast. And without further ado, here is the first entry in the Dunnealytics podcast. Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to the first ever Dunnealytics podcast. I want to thank you guys so much for joining. I'm here with my good friend and former roommate, Bo. Bo, how are you doing? Great. How about yourself? Not too bad. Can't complain, you know. First podcast, a little nervous, but also uh, very excited, really excited for this chapter. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I think little background so we can talk about um, why we're going to talk about what we are today. So uh, I'm a film major from TCU and Bo is a business major, but a, definitely a big film fanatic and film critic. Um, I think it's both safe. It's safe to say that we're both movie buffs in that in that term. Oh, for sure. hundred percent. But um, yeah, no, I mean, I think, I mean, we can just go straight into this too. So today we're going to be talking about the film industry and really just how different it is in today's modern era. Um, I think, you know, with, with everything going on with like streaming platforms, it's totally changed the format of how everything has operated, but especially film. And, um, you know, I was just curious, Bo, like, for you personally, I know you're a big fan of film. Um, you're a big fan of of old school directors specifically. Um, like, wh- what do you, what do you think really makes a movie a good movie to you? You know, that's a good question. I think uh, the, the foundation has to be in the writing for me. Um, and I've listened to a lot of interviews on actors and directors and what they think constitutes a good film, and they all say. You know, whether it's an actor taking a job or uh, a director deciding to direct a movie, it all starts with the script and the writing. And uh, I think if you don't have that, then it's hard to make a good movie. I mean, there's bad movies that have great writing, but there's no great movies with bad writing, I, I would say, from my point of view. But No, absolutely. Oh, and I think I should uh, mention that not only is Bo a film buff, um, but he's also an aspiring actor. So, um, no, I'm not going to say aspiring. I'm going to say future actor. Uh, uh, we'll see. I, I, you know, I generally believe you can do it, but, um, I guess going in, like just quickly transitioning into that, um, you know, we can talk about film for as long as we want. What, what, what makes you want to be an actor? What is it that's so compelling for you that if you could do anything in life, you would act? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I mean, for me, I think I always wanted to do it. I didn't really realize I wanted to do it till probably my sophomore year of college. Um, But for me, I just love the ability to become someone completely different from yourself. Like you watch, so my favorite actor, for example, is uh, Daniel Day-Lewis. And so you watch him and he just loses himself in performances like There Will Be Blood. I watch Mm -hmm. him and I don't see the actor anymore. Like, you know, some actors, you still see it's them just in a costume or whatever, but like with those really transcendent actors like Christian Bale that we like, you know, the actors we've talked about, it's, they just lose themselves entirely in it. And it takes the audience to a whole different place. And that's what I love about film is, um, you know, like let's say you're having a bad day or a great day or whatever kind of day, it just takes you to this place where your imagination can just really roam free. And it's just, it's, uh, it's just, it's really, I feel like it's like a spiritual experience watching like Star Wars for the first time. Like you watch, like, do you remember the first time you saw, like, the original Star Wars trilogy? I mean, it was just, like, this experience, experience <laughs> you've never had before. 
No, absolutely. No, I think um, I think that is so you know interesting too because I mean acting really is an art and you know really the the objective of a good actor is to take is to make an experience that takes the audience away from their current situation you know I mean a lot of people they go to watch a movie they go to escape they go you know they they want to escape their boring lives their nine to five job and they want to just spend an hour and a half two hours just involved in an experience and I mean I think um, I know like you really put me on to Daniel Day-Lewis um, and Paul Thomas Anderson movies um, like I mean for me I remember watching Lincoln I know he won the Oscar for that back in 2012 and just that total experience of like this isn't Daniel Day Lewis playing Abraham Lincoln this is Abraham Lincoln like he's not like I'm trying to do my best job at, at being Abraham Lincoln he's like no I am like that you you yeah. become that role and I think that's exactly. the most exciting thing about acting because you know for me it's like you know I've always loved acting and, and actors and just that 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 ability to become somebody different I think is something that you know is it's is really interesting you know I mean we all we all alter our personalities depending on who we're talking to but mm -hmm. at the end of the day it's like you're not altering your personality you're altering who you are which yeah. It's pretty cool when you think about it, you know, becoming a different person. Um, but not only that, it's like you, you, you're becoming a different person for like a long period of time. I mean, when you look at method actors, like you mentioned Christian Bale, like you are you're dedicating you're dedicating a big portion of your year of your life to that role to become that person. And sure. now, I mean, I think I think for me, it's like. But, but, but I, think, I think that's the biggest issue now is that you don't see as many actors like that in, in today's day and age, I feel like. Oh, I would agree. I would agree. Um, I mean, and just like with the movies they make today, I feel like it, the characters that they, they're writing now, they don't give way for that, you know, because a, mm -hmm. a lot of, I mean, I'm not going to say all characters now, but a lot of these movies are superhero movies and just these franchises and the way they write these characters are it's a lot of just like copy and paste and they're not as three-dimensional three as like taxi driver for example mm -hmm. or some of those character study movies that we used to see more of yeah no definitely i think taxi driver is a great example too of um of, of, of you you see it's not like a not like a coming of age story it kind of is but it, it's it's finding yourself and I think I think those stories for me are the most compelling. I mean, even going back to There Will Be Blood, it's like you, you see him in the beginning, and he's 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 young and hungry, and really trying to be you know to get rich from oil. And but in the beginning, he's a different person than who he is at the end. At the end, he's this ruthless, relentless person that will step on anybody he needs to to get what he wants. And I mean, I, I think you know, I mean, Taxi Driver. That's another great example of. A guy figuring out where his purpose is in life. You know, he's a, he's obviously a taxi driver, but he doesn't want to do that his whole life. He wants to do something. He wants to have a voice. He wants to influence the world. And I think those stories are so compelling too, because you, you know, for me, it's like the, those are the relatable stories. People have a passion. They have a dream. They have a goal. Whatever it is, you know, um, in any movie, fiction or nonfiction. Ultimately, the characters have a goal. They have a motive. And I think the movies where, you know, in, in today's modern film industry, like a great example of this um, is the Star Wars movies. Um, you know, talking about George Lucas's Star Wars movies, specifically like the, you know, episode four, five, and six, where we see Luke Skywalker. It's this whole aspect of the hero's journey. You know, Luke Skywalker is a farm boy that lives with his parents. He doesn't really have anything of his life. He's kind of, you know, seeking out adventure. He's looking for the call to adventure, but it, well, he's not even really seeking it out. It kind of comes to him. And, you know, you look at, you look at episode four, five, and six and how he progresses. He starts out, you know, knowing nothing, you know, he, he's mentored by at that time, Ben Kenobi. And he's like, I, he's struggling with the aspect of like, is this for me? I, I, am I really the one that's going to, to save the Jedi? 
And but you you look at like today's modern films, specifically with Star Wars, like um, I'm, I'm sure you've seen the the more recent Star Wars movies, or at least some of them, the the J.J. Abrams, um, like The Force Awakens, The Last Jedi, and you look at the character Rey. If you juxtapose that with Luke Skywalker, it's it's totally different. And I think that yes. you know, I mean, Luke Skywalker, he was developing. He was not. He was not prepared to take on Darth Vader, to take down the Sith in episode mm -hmm. four. He lost in episode five. It wasn't until episode six. It took three whole episodes for him to ultimately yeah. become who he was supposed to be and redeem himself. Um, whereas, like, Rey, I felt like immediately she was... Automatically like, good at everything. She, yeah, she was kick-ass, which is like, yeah. yeah, I get it. She's the chosen one. But, like... How would she like? Like, the, there's no progression. There's no. There's no conflict. There's no, you know, no. failure and then accomplishment to the, to the same degree of Luke Skywalker. It's more like, yeah, she's really good at what she does immediately, and Which, and it wasn't earned at all. Yeah, it wasn't earned. You know, it's like, I mean, what she went to Luke Skywalker for mentorship, but at that point she had already like. If if you compare that specifically with Episode Five where Luke Skywalker seeks the counsel of Yoda, he was so much further behind than Rey was. Rey, like, at this point, I think, I think Luke even mentioned something like, yep, you're basically better than me. You know, like, it's, it, and to me, that's, that's the biggest issue is like, no. You, you know, the whole point of a hero's journey, especially in a movie like Star Wars, is the fact that it takes time. You know, you have to, you have to work on these things and, and figure it out and discover yourself. Versus yeah. now, it's just, it seems, I mean, you know, you can it's compare. It's instant gratification now. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. And you know, I'm, I'm curious. I mean, I have my thoughts on it, but I want to get your thoughts. Why, why do you think that is? Yeah, that's a great question. It's Because it seems like for The Force Awakens, uh, which came out, what, 2014? Was that? I think so, 2015, yeah. 2015, something like that. Mm -hmm. That was just a copy and paste of A New Hope, when I saw it, at least. I mean, you have... Um, uh, raise the new Luke, and then you have uh, you, you brought back they brought back old characters like Han Solo, Chewbacca, and then and they killed uh, off Han Solo, <laughs> yeah. And then, of course, they killed off you know the fan favorite, and then Kylo's the new Darth Vader, um, and then Poe is the is like the new Han Solo or whatever. And so that just seemed like a copy and paste, but like where this new trilogy went wrong was like we said, her, her abilities weren't like grown over time. She just automatically had them. So like in her first meeting with like Kylo Ren, she wins and she's never trained in Jedi training in her life. And so it's like, mm -hmm. well, that's not earned. How can I get behind this character? Cause I haven't seen them fall and get back up, which is a trait of a hero is, is they do fail, but they keep um, overcoming their failures. And so, yeah. And then I just, like, obviously the original Star Wars were political. George Lucas himself even said it was kind of about, like, the Reagan administration and Vietnam and all those uh, aspects. But it just seemed more heavy-handed, this new trilogy. Yeah. Um, and I think no, that also yeah. divided audiences. I'm not saying it made them worse movies. I'm just saying I think it divided audiences more. No, no, absolutely. I mean, yeah, it, it, I think that was the other thing, too, is that it... it there's a lot of political commentary. There's always been political commentary in film. That's not new. Of course. But yeah. but it was a lot more subtle back then, whereas now I feel like it was it was done in an artistic way, whereas now it just seems like it's very blatant, you know? Yeah. Um, especially, I mean, it, it, it almost doesn't make sense in a movie like Star Wars 2 because, like, yeah, I understand. You know, you want to have – you, you, you want to you have political commentary and you want to – talk about key issues in today's society but star wars isn't in today's society it's in a you know galaxy far far away mm -hmm. in a time long long ago so it's like it, i understand that but you, you know really like forcing it down people's throats in an Amer like an american political aspect doesn't really fit as much when the film doesn't really have anything to do to apply to american society mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, no, I mean, I, I, I totally agree with you. And I think that is interesting because the one thing I did like about the new trilogy was uh, Kylo Ren's character arc. I think he had much more of a character arc 
Van Ray did. You know, oh, he, sure. he was at this conflict. I mean, he was Han Solo's son. Um, but there was, there was always, I mean, you see it more so, um, in, not in the first episode, but in the next two, uh, this, this inner conflict where he was so certain that what he was doing was the right thing. But, you know, he continues to struggle with that. And then ultimately at the end, you know, he does end up, you know, supporting Ray, basically joining the Jedi kind of, um, and I think for me that was much more of a hero's journey than than Ray's. Oh, I, I agree, mean, especially in the last movie when you know he sacrifices himself for her. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, like, like you said, like with his character, there's so much internal conflict, and mm -hmm. obviously uh, Adam Driver's I think one of the best actors working today. Uh, portrays him so well. I thought that was really my favorite aspect, like he just said, of the new trilogy was his performance in that character. Um, because I really didn't like the way they brought back the old characters. Yeah. Like, um, I don't know how you felt about how they brought back Luke Skywalker for uh, The Last Jedi, but he was to his character was totally different than mm -hmm. uh, the one I grew up with watching the original trilogy. And I didn't really... Yeah. They turned him into this very pessimistic... Uh, anti-jedi character which is just such a contrast from who he was which if you can do that but there has to be like a there has to be like a background to that which they do give it but it's not fleshed out well i don't think no no definitely and uh no i think they they you could still do that because it's like i you know a lot of time has progressed people can change but i really wish that they in some way, shape, or form, showed that progression. Like, why? What, how did he get to this point? Why is he so pessimistic? You know, because you look at, you know, the end of episode six. It's like, okay, he's um, defeated Darth Sidious. Um, Darth Vader, his father, you know, pretty much redeems himself. And but 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 there's no context of why he got to that point all of a sudden where he's so pessimistic and he's he's like we're basically doomed, you know, obviously that, and then, and then of course too, it's like, you, you got to think about years and years of stewing. If you, if you're, if you're really having that thought in your mind of, you know, there is no hope. And then all of a sudden, Oh, a new character comes and his mind is changed within a very short period of time. For me, it doesn't really add up, um, you know, versus like Ben Kenobi, when, when he, 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 the whole time, like, it was the exact same state, right? It was pessimistic. The Jedi were kind of struggling, and the Sith were really, or the Republic were really in power. But he still had faith. You know, he still believed that, um, that Luke could redeem him. Back then, it was like, yeah, we're in a very difficult circumstance. It's like, we have all the, the odds stacked against us. But at the same time, he still believed. You know, it wasn't like here where I, uh, you know, I, I don't believe that we, we have any chance. And then a few minutes later, oh yeah, actually we got this. Like, I, I know for me, I find that so hard to believe just from the aspect of human nature, you know, people, te especially when you have years and years of stewing on a certain belief, um, to instantly be swayed in a few short moments for me, it just doesn't, it, it's not passable, but I mean, I, I, you see that so much in today's film industry because, and I kind of want to transition to our next point, uh, yeah. you know, why we're talking about that instant gratification and how movies now, a lot of times it's a lot of high suspense, high action. They need to constantly, um, you know, keep things moving. There's no, there's no time for slower character development. I mean, you, you see that in like the Mandalorian and stuff, but that's different because television series, it's a lot easier to do that than in a movie. Um, but I mean, personally, I think a lot of that just has to do with the era that we live in. You know, nowadays with all the social media, it's so much instant gratification. You know, people, people's attention spans have gotten shorter and shorter. Oh, and, yeah. you know, I mean, personally, I can think about it because like, you know, I, I go on YouTube a good amount and say I got, I'm like, okay, I want to, you know, watch YouTube for half an hour. And there's this video that seems interesting, but Ooh, it's uh, it's 22 minutes. That's a little bit long. But then I have no problem watching, you know, 50, 30 second short videos. Yeah, and I'm like, exactly. 
okay, I would I spent more time watching those videos than I did watching this one video. And yeah. I think the same thing applies to the film industry, and they're very aware of that. I'm sure they've done so much analytics on you know people's attention spans um, involving movies, and they just find that you know people need to inst- they need to be just bombarded with visuals constantly because that's what we're doing when we're looking at our phones, and so I mean that's a big problem, and I guess I, that's my question is. If, if George Lucas were to release Star Wars in 2022, the original version, same script, everything, do you think it would be the critically acclaimed series that it is today? I do, and that's what I think separates a great movie from a good movie is its timelessness. Like, So I think like Citizen Kane, if they came out with that this year, I, st- I still think people would love it um, mm-hmm. because – I mean, think about, like, The Godfather, too. That came out in 72, 74. I mean, mm-hmm. I, think everyone yeah, I, think still, was... I think everyone would still love that movie. Um, yeah. But, but I wonder if it would be to the same extent. Because, I mean, so much of The Godfather, so much of Citizen Kane is, is nostalgia. I mean, you know, mm. that era, too, it's like, specifically, you go sit down and watch a film. It was a treat. Nowadays, it's like, I could watch hundreds of films i have netflix hbo hulu i can watch any movie i want Mm -hmm. and i feel like that selection almost dampens not the quality of movies but the aspect of like you know just like how much of a privilege i don't know what i'm trying to say but like like, the event of it like whereas it used to be like an event and like Mm -hmm. yeah versus yeah you you like like, oh let's let's go to the movies you know like i mean i remember when i was a little kid it's like I didn't. Maybe I got to see some Disney movies on VHS, but you know, it wasn't it wasn't that common. So when my parents would be like, "Hey, we're gonna take you out to a movie," or there'd be a movie that I was really excited about. I mean, I remember when the original Spider Man movies came out with yeah. Tobey Maguire, and it was like, "Wow, you know, just, I want to go see the Spider Man movie." And you know, that was like the only time or place you could watch it. Nowadays, it's like, you know, I watched. I mean. Spider-Man uh, Into the Spider-Verse. It was like, I didn't even watch it in theaters because I was like, oh, I can I can watch it at home, you know? Yeah, on Netflix, right. And, it, but, and I feel like that, that takes some of the quality out of it because watching a movie in the theaters versus watching it at home is, it's, it's totally a different thing. Oh, for sure. I mean, that's, um, I saw Ben Affleck just had some comments on where he thinks the industry's going because, um, him and Matt Damon and another writer co-wrote uh, The Last Duel, and they had Ridley Scott direct it, and they also starred in it. And uh, it just bombed at the box office, like mm-hmm. incredibly bad at the box office, although I think that was to do with like the marketing and advertising of it myself. Because um, I didn't go see it my, in the theaters myself, but I, I didn't really know about it. I don't think they mm-hmm. advertised as well as they could have, but he was talking about how he thinks there's just going to be all like Marvel movies. Like they're going to make like 40 a year and that's all it's going to be in theaters. And he, you know, he won an Oscar for Argo. Uh, mm-hmm. I think he won that for best director possibly. But um, he said that would probably be a TV miniseries now. Like he does not think that movie would get made today, which is crazy. Cause that was only what, 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's just crazy to me that the film industry is changing that fast. And I do see, I do agree with him on where he sees it heading with just being like superhero movies and franchises so no absolutely i mean so in my past in um in my major too we had to study the box office numbers specifically um i mean obviously the pandemic pretty much eliminated all box office numbers because theaters were closed um but even prior to that and now that theaters are open people people just aren't going into theaters unless like you said it's for like a marvel a big box office movie like um, spider-man no way home yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah and i mean and that's the thing too so i was reading an article earlier today and they were talking about in 2021 um box office percentage is up 78 percent, which is like okay that's very significant but then you look you look at the numbers and a massive portion of that is solely due to spider-man it, yeah. it, like People weren't going in to see, I mean, I, I haven't gotten to see it yet, but people weren't going in to see Licorice Pizza, the new Paul Thomas Anderson movie. People weren't going in to see the new Kingsman movie. People are going to see Spider-Man. And because for them, it's like that, that, that that's the only thing that can get people in seats nowadays. 
is these big, you know, mar I mean, Marvel movies, superhero movies. And I mean, it, it, on top of that too, it's like, okay, 78% sounds like a significant amount, but you realize that 78% from 2020, which was, I mean, A, it's like theaters were closed. So clearly the box office percentage is going to be practically zero. Um, mm -hmm. but on top of that too, it's like 78% from a very, very low number is still nowhere near in comparison to what it used to be. And, oh, yeah. You know, I mean, I, I hope, I, I genuinely do hope that the film industry can, at some point, you know, continue to progress back into the box office. But that's probably not going to happen because, I mean, nowadays, you know, I mean, it, it used to be that in the film industry, you'd release a film in theaters and it would be out for two to four months. And then, and these were the specific contract write-ups because obviously the, the production studios have contracts with you know amc with regal theater cinemark stuff like that and so they agree okay we'll release the movie for x number of, of days x number of months and then after that we'll release it on you know platforms on i mean i guess nobody really uses like blu-ray or cd anymore um but that was the agreement nowadays they find that i'm not going to be profitable at all if i release it to box office so i'm just going to release it straight to the streaming platforms Wait, and they can't count on those uh, the revenues from the DVDs and VHS sales that they used to really be able to count on if they di if it didn't perform well at the box office. I was I was uh, listening to an executive talk about that. Um, you know, I think YouTube they have that uh, producers roundtable or they have actors directors too where they have like a mm -hmm. bunch of people sit around a table and interview. And uh, I, I don't know if it's from Warner Brothers or who it was, but they were saying how in like the golden age of Hollywood. You release in, in theaters, and then you knew you were going to make your money back either way just from the DVD and VHL, VHS sales, but that's just not mm. the case anymore. So it's just no. harder to finance movies now, they were saying. No, absolutely. And, I mean, I think, um, you know, it, it really is just a different era too. But on top of that, you know, and, and Scorsese, I know we, we both have talked about this, um, but I think, I mean – it has to do mainly with the films that are being produced. Um, but, you know, Scorsese said modern films are devaluing film itself. Mm -hmm. You know, like films have lost value, not in not in necessarily a term of monetary value, but just in value of production itself and storytelling. And, you know, I think, you know, part of it has to do with, you know, what we talked about where it's like, OK, well, it, a film is going to be devalued quite literally if it can't get money. That's obvious. But on top of that, too, people people know that, okay, if I'm producing a film, I have to make something that sells. I have to make something that's going to make people want to watch. People are going to want to watch Marvel movies, and Marvel knows they have a formula for how they're going to get people to watch. But then you have slower burning films where it's all about character development, and I, I, I know those films are still appreciated today, but not to the same level and not to the same amount of people as it was, you know, 10 years ago. Oh, for sure. I was thinking about this, too. Like, Wolf of Wall Street's a critically acclaimed film. I'm, I'm curious, too. It's like, not only from a political perspective of it being politically correct, but just from a perspective of it being an entertaining movie, I wonder what the box office numbers would be if it was released today versus back then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it makes but you think. no, it really does, and you know, I think the the industry is is struggling quite a bit, and I think Scorsese has a point where it's like people, the, you know, the directors, producers, they don't care about making a film that's their vision; they care about making a film that's going to make money. And I understand that to a certain extent. It's like you know, at the end of the day, if you're making a movie, you're not like, oh, I hope that we're you know. 10 mil in the negative. No, you're trying to make money, but yeah. they, but that's their, their sole focus. Whereas, you know, Scorsese, Tarantino, it's like, look, I don't care if the film bombs. This is what I want to do. This is my vision. Mm -hmm. You know, like they're, they're giving up their artistic integrity for the aspect of making money. Yeah, no, I mean, but, I think you, you can owe that to all these publicly traded companies buying mm -hmm. these movie studios now. And so yeah. they have a responsibility to their shareholders to make money. And so in order to do that, 
their movies have to make money versus you know maybe in old with old school um, in the studios it was about making money to make more movies mm -hmm. not just a profit but I think we've seen this I mean you see more studio meddling in the final cut of films now more than ever I think and I think that's like a big draw to um, companies like A24 where there are these I think the max a movie can be uh, financed is 10 million but I think they give pretty much complete uh, creative control to the directors and so you, that's why you see great movies like um, I think I told you about it, First Reformed which was directed by Paul Schrader uh, who wrote Taxi Driver. This one, this one's about a priest uh, played by Ethan Hawke and kind of deals with uh, climate change and uh, loneliness and all that. It has a lot of themes from Taxi Driver, but great film. Then uh, we talked about like The Lighthouse, too, with uh, Robert Eggers. He mm -hmm. did that through A24. So, um, and, yeah, and, it, it, it's definitely different now, though. Yeah, and that's the thing, too, is that I think, I mean, we we might just sound like old heads like oh they're not making any good films nowadays because they are i mean lighthouse oh, 2019 came out. dude 2019 was one of the best years for film i can remember mm -hmm. no absolutely i mean films like parasite for me it's like that's a great movie it, that's an example that like the film industry still like has, has exciting young new directors with oh, new sure. film formats and like just i mean Really, really entertaining, but different. Yeah, I mean, you saw that. You saw 1917 with uh, mm -hmm. Sam Mendes doing it all as a, a single continuous shot. I mean, you saw uh, that was Tarantino's latest film was uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Uh, mm -hmm. I loved the movie Ad Astra, too. I thought that was underrated. You had The Joker, which was yeah. hugely controversial. I mean, that was such a great year for films. I mean, I can't Absolutely. remember a year as good as that in terms of, like, yeah. the number of quality films in one year. Man, I mean... Last, I mean, I, I, the last time I could think about it would be like in the early 2010s, maybe like 2012, 2013. Um, so, I mean, it, you're right. There's, you know, there's still a whole lot of good movies coming out and a lot of people that do appreciate those. Um, so, I, you know, I, I don't think that that's necessarily the problem, but it's not to the same degree, you know, in terms of box office revenue. And I think that's that's the biggest problem is that it discourages these directors to make these films that are a little bit not risque, but a little bit uh, different, more autistic or artistic. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I mean, I, I think, that, you know, that, that that's just a big problem is that, you know, if, if only if only I had a billion dollars and I could just give it to all these directors to encourage them, you know, exactly. to continue to make these great films. But I mean, that's just I don't have that money, unfortunately. And, um, you know, it, it, it just it's really it's difficult. It's it. It's good that there are still great films and great directors coming out, but I feel like it's not to the same level of what it used to be. Well, I mean, like, yeah, for sure. I mean, although next year I am excited. Oh, I'm sorry. This year, I keep forgetting it's 2022, but uh, this year I mean, <laughs> there's some great films coming out. I mean, you have the new Batman directed by mm -hmm. Matt Reeves. You have uh, Robert Eggers' new film, uh, The Northman, with uh, Alexander Skarsgård, which is like a Viking movie, but it's based off Hamlet. Mm -hmm. um, which have you seen the preview for the trailer for that yet? Uh, no, I've not. Oh, it, Check that out. it looks really good. Yeah, it's got yeah. Uh, Anya Taylor Joy, Ethan Hawke, a uh, bunch bunch of people. But, you're a big, uh, you're a big good. Ethan Hawke fan, aren't you? I think he's a great actor. Um, you know, I first saw him in uh, Dead Poets Society, which is a great mm, film. It's a great um, movie. And then he did the Before trilogy, and then. Uh, and I, I thought he had one of the best performances I've ever seen in First Reformed. Um, mm -hmm. That's one. Honestly, that's probably a top ten movie for me. I've probably watched it twenty times. Oh yeah, no, I mean, well, I've been watched it twenty times, but, uh, <laughs> but no, I mean, I know for you specifically, and we can kind of backtrack back into this. Um, you know, you wanting to be an actor, and I, th I think nowadays, you know, this kind of goes with everything, talking about social media and everything, but the. The market for actors is is so colluded in the sense of it's a lot easier to get your name out there, but there's so many other people that want to be actors that are able to get their names out there as well. So I True. think you know, and, and uh, you know, I know we we we've spoken about 
actors that have really tried, you know, or it took them a long time to get their foot in the door. Um, you know, talk about Brian Cranston and how he worked, you know, multiple odd jobs, security guard. What, I mean, what, yeah, you know better than I do. What, what other jobs did he work? I think it was like that, uh, you know, driving a truck, just like, I think it, he was pretty much doing whatever he could because I think he had a family that he was trying to support, but uh, he mm. also had that, you know, this dream of being an actor, so he was just trying to do anything he could to put food on the table, but, um, mm-hmm. I mean, obviously, you really respect those guys because I feel like, like, our generation, I mean, there's people like that, but I feel like, like we were talking about the instant gratification, all these people that want to become actors, they want to just go straight to being an A-list celebrity, and they don't want to, mm. like you know, work towards it at all. Like, you know, take like the 10 years to become a great actor, then start, you know, doing it. Um, no, absolutely. I mean, same with, um, with Mark Ruffalo too, you know, he auditioned for hundreds of roles. Before 600 times, I think. That's crazy to me. It's like, I mean, the, 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 the and it, I, I personally, it's like, if I got to 50 auditions and got nothing, I'd be like, maybe this isn't for me. You know? Exactly. I mean, you have to have an insane amount of self belief and just determination to do that. And especially with like the cost of living in LA is insane. Mm-hmm. I mean, as as someone trying to make it an acting set, it's like waiting tables. You can make money, but it's just like I mean, gas is what like seven bucks a gallon right now. Like it's just <laughs> yeah, like it's, it's crazy. Like how do you live out there trying to be an actor? I mean, I, I just don't know how you even try to do that anymore like just move out there and rough it for 10 years i have no idea how people do that i think that's the one great thing i love about the era we live in is that you don't need to be in la to to make it in the film industry you know it used to be you'd have to go to hollywood and you would just hope you would you would you would be knocking on the door of producers and you would just hope that somebody would give you a role and it's like if not okay you're broke you're in a city that you're unfamiliar with good luck you know, type of thing. You got to figure it out. And, you know, nowadays it is a little bit easier in the sense of, I mean, I could, I could Google search auditions and I could audition for 50 roles online if I wanted to today. And I think well, that's the great thing about it. Yeah. And then you have TikTok. Like you see all these TikTok people like uh, West Side Story that Spielberg just directed. He found her on like TikTok or YouTube or something. And then he like specifically waited for her. Because I think she had like a school play she wanted to do her, for her high school, and he waited to start shooting his movie till she was available. Like that's how bad he wanted her. But he just saw her on like YouTube or TikTok, which is crazy. Man, wouldn't that be nice? Ma- imagine, imagine you're on TikTok, you're just posting <laughs> videos, and Steven Spielberg hits you up and is like, "Hey, I want you to be in my new movie." Honestly, how great! I mean, and then have you seen that new that one kid on TikTok? I just read about this. He. uh He's an aspiring actor. I think he's 22, so he's our age. Um, and then he, he was, like, vlogging about his process applying to Juilliard uh, for acting. And uh, he didn't get in. And all these people on TikTok are, like, wanting to do, like, a protest outside Juilliard and, you know, like, protest against them as, an, as a school. And then he even got, like, direct messages from, uh, like, Charlie Puth because he didn't get in uh, for music. And he was like, hey, man, like, I didn't get in either. It's going to work out. And now he's already yeah. in LA, like, uh, you know, meeting with producers and stuff. So it's just like making a TikTok and get you where you want to go <laughs> these days. I mean, it really is just doing anything and, and everything that you can possibly do to, um, you know, get your name out there. I think, I, exactly. I think that's the biggest thing. And, um, you know, I think that's interesting to talk about, too, because, you know, you want to be you want to be an actor and, you know, with with there's so many people i mean being an actor has always been one of the favorite jobs i mean no, who doesn't want to get paid millions of dollars to be loved by people and be seen on screen exactly but, but i think that's no, no, no. that's a huge pitfall though it's like yeah you, ha- you have to do it for the right reasons i think because like i think a lot of people that end up disappointed are the people that do it just for like fame or celebrity or you know to get rich or you know they just yeah. want to see themselves on the cover of a magazine or you know, they want to be on Ellen DeGeneres' show or whatever it is. But Well, it's James Corden now. Ellen's canceled. Oh, oh that's right. She got canceled. I forgot. <laughs> but, I mean, I think that's why a lot of people burn out after years because they're not doing it for the love of acting itself. It's just like a means to an end for them to, you know, satisfy their ego, I feel like. I feel like because mm-hmm. I think I read this statistic by this uh, producer 
talk about actors. He said like every year, like 10,000 young people move out to LA, you know, in search of stardom or whatever you want to call it. And after one year, a hundred will be there for the second year. And mm -hmm. out of that hundred, 10 will make it. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's just such a, uh, well, obviously a low percentage shot of making it, but a lot of people pursue it. And I think still, I mean, I'm, I'm sure the numbers are down a little bit with COVID. I'm sure some, more people are staying home. And like you said, I mean, you can audition. You, I mean, how many Zoom auditions are there now? And then they shoot, like they shot the new Spider-Man in, in Atlanta. They're not shooting as much in LA anymore. Mm -hmm. But no, no, I mean, you're absolutely right. And I think you know, that brings up a great point too. It's like, you know, if you really want to be an actor, a director, you can't just do it because, oh, I want to be, you know, I want to be rich and I want to be famous. Like you have to it's really- a TikToker. Yeah, you have you to, yeah, you have to really love, you have to really love the art and you have to really have a passion for it. Because I mean, going to that, like, I mean, I see that so much in TikTok now, you know, um, you know, as you know, I used to have a TikTok and, um, you know, right. I, I made videos because it was like, oh, I want to make a video. I thought it was, you know, funny. I hopefully if it makes one person laugh, I'm happy. Um, but the, you, you see so much on TikTok of people just wanting to be famous. You'll, they'll put something like, if this doesn't blow up, I swear. Like pe yeah. they just want, it doesn't matter if it's for a few short moments, they want their moments of fame, you know? And, and I think nowadays it's like, I mean, really it's pretty easy to get in TikTok. I mean, I feel like if you post a hundred videos, one of them is probably going to catch and exactly. people know that. And so they're like, oh, I just, I want to be famous for, even if it's for short moments, I want to be, you know, like it, it's the easiest way to do so. And so, you know, they go into that with that mindset, but they apply it to the same things like acting, you know, directing anything else. So like, oh, you know, uh, I got this instant gratification because one of the videos I posted on TikTok got a million views. I can do the same in the film industry. But that, that, that's the whole point is they're like, I want to do this so I can get views, so I can be seen. It's not yeah. because I love the art of acting and then, you know, it's, it, I want to do this. I want to perform for people. I want people to get an experience. It's, I exactly. want to be famous. Exactly. I mean, um, it's like with Addison Rae, like she got big on TikTok and then now she just did a movie this past year. I didn't see it, but um, mm -hmm. I heard the, it. The D'Amelios, the D'Amelios have a TV show on Hulu. Yeah. And I'm, and, uh, and then I saw my mom was telling me that these, um, girls on TikTok, they're at, they did like a rendition of the show's uh, theme song or whatever. And now their version is used as the show's intro or whatever, which is crazy. That's actually pretty cool. That is. Oh. I mean, if, if I could sing, I'd try that, but I'm, I'm a terrible yeah. singer. I don't know about you. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to stick to uh, talking in front of a microphone. Yeah, same. I was, same. I was a good singer before I hit puberty, but then... Oh, uh, uh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, but then uh, it, all, it all went away when I was like 11 or 12 years old. But yeah, no, I yeah. mean, you're absolutely right. It's, it's, uh, it, it really is an interesting time that we live in in terms of like, you know, you, you, it is, it's never been easier to, to be seen out in the world. Um, oh, for sure. But at the same time, it's like people, people are aware of that. And so they just... They want they want to be seen. They want they want people to recognize them and to love them, um, versus wanting to just do this for a living. Like not not if if the money was gone, if the fame was gone, I wonder how many people would truly want to be an actor. Would truly want to be in television and movies. Exactly. I mean, I'd say the number is very few. I mean, yeah. and I think the the great actors are the ones that love the art of it. Like, uh, like we've, we've talked about, uh, Daniel Day Lewis, Christian Bale. Um, you know, I think Leo's a great actor. Um, I just actually just watched his movie. Don't look up last night. Mm, yeah. Uh, have you seen that? No, but I, uh, gosh, I want to, I know it's, it's I, so it, there's like a meteor heading to earth. Like it's going to be like the end of the world. Right. And he's a, he's a scientist. Yeah. He's an astronomer. And then Jennifer Lawrence is like his PhD student that, first discovered it and then I mean I've never seen a cast like it I mean I feel like 95% of this film's budget was just on cast mm. uh, I mean great performances I didn't really care for the film myself um, I, I mean mm. I would encourage you to watch it there's some funny moments but um, I don't know it's just I don't know Adam Adam McKay's a good director I mean he did Anchorman and that's kind of what got him started 
I uh, was doing a lot with Will Ferrell, but I don't know. It, was, it, it just wasn't what I was expecting, I guess. And I thought the editing and the cutting of it was a little weird and choppy, but I mean, hmm. you'll have to watch it and let me know what you think. Okay. But. No, and I think, um, so one movie I literally saw two days ago, I know it's like a, the most generic Jim Bro movie, uh, Pumping Iron. Um, oh, yeah. And I think for me, it's like, you know, when, when we were, you know, you and I were talking about what we were going to discuss in this podcast, and I was really thinking about it, um, you know, watching Pumping Iron, because, uh, you know, it is a documentary on Arnold Schwarzenegger in the, the 1975 Olympias. Um, but ultimately, I think the, for me, the most compelling thing about films is that they specifically try to make you feel a certain way. You know, they, they try to in, in, maybe inspire you or you know, make you aware of a certain um, situation. But ultimately, there should be an objective, not just for the film to be like, okay, this is the story we want to say, but like this is, this is what we want people to get from the movie, you know? Mm -hmm. And you know, I mean, in Pumping Iron, it's like, okay, what do we want people to get from this movie? We want people, to, first of all, like, I mean, back then, bodybuilding was not as well known as it is nowadays. I mean, nowadays you have millions of influencers posting their lifts on Instagram and TikTok every single day. But back then, it's like we want, we want to inspire people to go in the gym and want to better themselves, want to make themselves more confident, happy, and look and feel better. And, you know, I mean, in any movie, it's like, you know, you go back to Taxi Driver, you go back to Tarantino movies, you go back to, I mean, to critically acclaimed films, and all of them are trying to create some form of emotion, some form of motivation um, for people. And I feel like nowadays you don't see that in as many movies. Um, I mean, you know, you, you could say in Marvel movies, it's like, yeah, it inspires kids to want to be superheroes. But, you know, at the same time, it's like, okay, that's not, that's not a realistic thing. It's not creating, you know, true, you know, your kid's not going to grow up one day and be like, hey, if I work really hard, I'm going to be Spider-Man. <laughs> yeah. Of course, of course, of course, kids, you know, want to believe that. And of course we should encourage them to, uh, to, you know, to pursue their dreams. But at the same time, it's like, okay, as far as realistic movies go, I feel like that's, there's few and far between in terms of films that generally, want to make people feel a certain way. They want to create a certain emotion. And I'm sure they all do, but, um, it, you know, it just goes back to that point of they're, they're really focusing on, you know, the revenue, on getting people to watch it versus, you know, truly creating inspiration for people to watch these movies or people to take away from the films. For sure. No, absolutely. And, um, you know, I think we can, you know, transition that, to um, you know, talking about directors that do that, who, who would you say are your favorite? Direct I mean, I know you like Paul Thomas Anderson, you like Scorsese, but who, what director would you say best accomplishes this for you? That's a great question. Um, I'm trying to think. I know it's very subjective, and you could say, well, there's a hundred different directors, and all their different movies, you know, do that. But um, I guess what, what director would you say inspires you the most? Inspire, okay, inspires me. Um, I mean, it's generic. I, I think uh, Stanley Kubrick's big for me. Um, mm -hmm. The Shine's my favorite movie of all time, mm -hmm. probably, um, just because I think he, his filmmakers so sophisticated and everything in every single shot of the movie is there for a reason. And I'm sure it's like that with other directors, but it's just like there's a hidden meaning in everything, every scene in that movie. Mm -hmm. um, and even like with like 2001 Space Odyssey, which is widely considered like a top, what, five film of all time, I'd say by most people. I mean, he's just so thorough. And I mean, obviously this guy was a genius. He did like advanced calculus in between, like during set, uh, breaks on set, which is, I mean, I, Took me three tries to get through calculus myself, but, <laughs> um, but I mean, obviously he's great. I really like uh, Robert Eggers. Uh, mm. who we were talking about the North, but he did the Lighthouse, and his first feature was uh, the Witch, which got Anya mm. Taylor Joy big. I mean, she's in everything now. I mean, yeah, she's in Peaky Blinder. She's in Last Night in Soho. I mean, she's in like two, three movies a year now. Um, mm. I think his his films really have have a pulse to them, have a central message. Um, and then who's, uh, what's another one? Uh, Ari Astro did Hereditary. 
He's good. And then uh, the Dune director, what, what's his name again? I always mispronounce it. Gosh. Yeah, I, I know it's like, you know what? Denis, right? Yeah, I can't even pronounce it to... Yeah, yeah Denis Villanueva. Yeah, yeah, him. I think or he's... It, yeah. I think he's great. Um, mm-hmm. I really enjoyed his film uh, Arrival. I thought mm-hmm. that was great. Um, he also did, like, what, Sicario, Prisoners. I mean, he's everything he's done lately has been amazing. Dune. Yeah. I know oh, you yeah. like Dune as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, Which, I think... Uh, uh, no, oh, sorry. You, you can finish Oh, go ahead. That. Uh, oh, right. no, I was just going to say... Um, Going back to, like, I think you brought up Stanley Kubrick. I think that's a great example. I mean, <clears throat> I understand the film era at that time, you know, when, when Kubrick was, you know, really at the height of his career. It's different than it is now. But, um, you know, I, I watched this analysis on Clockwork Orange, which is one of his critically acclaimed films, um, but is also, I mean, one of the most, like, unique movies, in my opinion, to ever come out. And... Oh. There were so many people that were against the film when he initially released it because it's like this is, this is so out there. This is so risque. Like I think what? it was actually banned in the UK for a while after its mm-hmm. release. And you know, it, 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 that, I think that it, Kubrick is a perfect example of somebody who goes, "No, I have a vision. Okay, this is this is the movie I want to make. I don't care if two people watch it or two billion. At the end of the day, this is my vision, and for me, this is a good film." And, you know, like, that, that's a perfect example. And, and ultimately, too, it worked out because the movie did get quite a bit of box office success, which, you know, nobody was expecting. And I think that, that goes to show the, the comparison of, of directors that make movies to sell versus make movies that are based off of their vision. Oh, for sure. And that was, that was a movie that was based off, uh, it was adapted from a book. And what's mm-hmm. funny, what I've noticed is a lot of the great, greatest movies of all time a lot of them are from books originally, which is funny, mm. looking yeah. at the the tendency for that. I mean, The Godfather was from a book. Um, I mean, a lot of the, like The Shining, which, I, I mean, that was written by Stephen King. Mm. Uh, a lot of the greatest movies ever. I, I, I wonder why that is. Yeah. Shining's another example of a movie that people think, they didn't think that it was going to do well. Um, and I think there's a lot of uh, criticism because they're like, you're not going to do the book justice. Um, and it, it did like, turn out to be uh, very different than the book. And that's oh, why absolutely. Stephen King hated it. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, for me, it's like, I feel like most of the Stephen King movies that have come out, they've either followed the book entirely and not done so well, or they've done their own renditions of it and they perform pretty well. Mm-hmm. Um which I mean, I think goes to show you can't just you can't just regurgitate, you know, the entire pages of a book on a film. You need to you need to make it your own, for sure. But well, Bo, I uh, want to thank you so much for coming on. Uh, I appreciate well, you talking about this. Yeah, um, thanks for having me. It is an yeah. honor to be the first guest. <laughs> yeah, no, seriously, and thank you for all the people listening and watching. I appreciate it. And uh, this has been Dunny Lytics, So thank you again.